Good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship here at Ansley United Church in Markdale, Ontario. It is Sunday, August the 9th, uh, 2020. So glad that you have joined us um, online again, and I know that you're sitting at home having your morning coffee and uh, ready for church. So uh, we are ready for church as well. We have our usual crew here with us, David and Tim behind the controls, uh, David Fries at the organ, and Mary and Jane are <clears throat> offering songs for us. So uh, we're happy to be back. Um, these next two services, I'm just going to finish off our jaunt through the book of Genesis. And uh, after that, we'll get back to maybe some more uh, normal stuff. But uh, I hope that you've enjoyed uh, this uh, series through the book of Genesis. I know I have. However, I'm also kind of ready to get back to, to normal things. Just one thing before we begin. Uh, we have uh, now reached 63 of you who have uh, subscribed to us on YouTube. And uh, uh, we need 100 so if we could get 100 people subscribing to us, that would be awesome. But it also means quite a lot in terms of how YouTube treats us and, and how, uh, you know, how important we become on the network like that. So we do need 37 more people. If you are one of those who've been hedging and hemming and not sure what that means, just uh, at the end of our service today or even before, uh, just press that uh, subscribe button. They take a tiny little bit of information from you, but it's pretty painless, and uh, it will really help. So thanks very much if you can do that. We'll begin with our prelude. We gather in the light of Christ. We have the light of Christ with us, around us, beneath us, above us, and beside us. So let us worship in the light of Christ. Amen. I'd like to begin in our call to worship with these words from a beautiful song called Nella Fantasia. 
Nella Fantasia means In My Dreams, and it is a, a, a sweet song. And if you're interested in looking up an online version of it, Sarah Brightman is, uh, does a beautiful version, and I uh, encourage you to do that, not right now, but after church. In my dreams, I see a fair world. Everyone lives in peace and in honesty there. I dream of souls that are always free, like the clouds that float, full of humanity, in the depths of the soul. In my dreams, I see a bright world. Even the night is less dark there. I dream of souls that are always free, like the clouds that float, full of humanity, in the depths of the soul. In my dreams, there exists a warm wind that breathes on the people like a friend. I dream of souls that are always free, like clouds that float full of humanity in the depths of the soul. We're going to sing a hymn. It is in the More Voices hymn book, number 10, called Come and Seek the Ways of Wisdom. I commend the words of that hymn to you if ever you're looking for just a, a prayer or a little meditation uh, in your daily prayer time just read through the words of that uh, song they are absolutely stunningly beautiful well now I'd like us to engage in a time of prayer and uh, this is kind of a multifaceted prayer today uh, we'll begin with a moment of quiet and then there's a spoken prayer and then uh, there's a little bit more silence. And then we're going to sing Spirit of Life. And then we're going to say the prayers of St. Francis together. So if you have that open, uh, that would be great. And we could say it all together. So let's begin with a moment of quiet. May our prayer today lead us to calm waters. May our prayer today fill our spirits with peace. May our prayer today give us strength for these days. May our prayer today lift our hearts with hope. 
May we hear the Spirit's movement in our lives. May we see the Spirit's movement in our world. May our hearts respond to the cries of those in need. May our hearts respond to the joy we find in others. May this day be a doorway into gratitude. And may we find the path filled with many blessings. As we gather today, let us remember those who are anxious or tired, fearful or hurt or confused. Let us remember those who are suffering, whether in body or mind or spirit. And let us pray for their healing. Let us remember those in our community who are sick or who need our prayers right now. Let us remember those who are still very much engaged in the front lines of the COVID pandemic. We pray for their health and well-being. Let us, in this moment of silence, hear the words we need to hear or speak the words we need to speak. And now, let's sing together, Spirit of Life, come unto me. To complete our prayer time, uh, I've included a version of the prayer of St. Francis, and I invite you to pray it with me. Let us pray. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, let me offer pardon. Where there is doubt, Let me have faith. Where there is despair, let me bring hope. Where there is darkness, let me be light. Where there is sadness, let me find joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. 
So today, uh, as part of our scripture uh, lessons, I'm going to include some, what I would call, modern day scripture. Uh, these are some of the words uh, made famous uh, in a book called Long, The Long Road to Freedom, or Long Walk to Freedom, I mean, by Nelson Mandela. No one is born hating another person because of the color of his skin or his background or his religion. People must learn to hate. And if they can learn to hate, they can be taught to love. For love comes more naturally to the human heart than its opposite. And this reading, as I walked out the door toward the gate that would lead to my freedom, I knew if I didn't leave my bitterness and hatred behind, I would still be in prison. As we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. And one last quote. The truth is that we are not yet free. We have merely achieved the freedom to be free the right not to be oppressed. We have not taken the final step of our journey, but the first step on a longer and even more difficult road. For to be free is not merely to cast off one's chains, but to live in a way that respects and enhances the freedom of others. The true test of our devotion to freedom is just beginning. Pretty wise words from Madiba Nelson Mandela. Now our scripture reading from Genesis, because as I said, we are finishing off the book of Genesis, um, is the story of Joseph. Now the story of Joseph is uh, 10 chapters long. Uh, so obviously we're not reading all of it today. It is a very long story. And uh, if you were to read the Quran, it's also in the Quran. Interestingly enough, it's a little bit longer uh, in the Quran. So both of those uh, texts uh, really revere the story of Joseph. I'm just reading the very beginning of it, the part that you are all maybe most familiar with. When Jacob's son Joseph was 17 years old, he took care of the sheep with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah. But he was always telling his father all sorts of bad things about his brothers. Now Jacob loved Joseph more than he did any of his other sons because Joseph was born after Jacob was very old. Jacob had given Joseph a fancy coat to show that he was his favorite son. And so Joseph's brothers hated him and would not be friendly to him. One day, Joseph told his brothers what he had dreamed, and they hated him even more. He said, let me tell you about my dream. We were out in the field tying up bundles of wheat. Suddenly, my bundle stood up and your bundles gathered around and bowed down to it. His brothers asked, Do you really think you are going to be king and rule over us? Now they hated Joseph more than ever because of what he had said about his dream. Well, Joseph later had another dream, and he told his brothers, Listen to what else I dreamed. The sun, the moon, and eleven stars all bowed down to me. When he told his father about this dream, his father became angry and said, What's that supposed to mean? Are your mother and I and your brothers all going to come and bow down in front of you? Joseph's brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept wondering about this very strange dream. One day when Joseph's brothers had taken the sheep to a pasture near Shechem, his father Jacob said to him, I want you to go to your brothers. They are with the sheep near Shechem. Yes, sir, Joseph answered. His father said, go and find out how your brothers and the sheep are doing, then come back and let me know. So we sent him from Hebron Valley. 
But before he got there, they saw him coming, and the brothers made plans to kill him. They said to one another, Look, here comes the hero of those dreams. Let's kill him and throw him into a pit and say that some wild animal ate him. Then we'll see what happens to those dreams. Reuben heard this and tried to protect Joseph from them. Let's not kill him, he said. Don't murder him or harm him. Just throw him into a dry well out here in the desert. Reuben planned to come back and rescue Joseph later. When Joseph came to his brothers, they pulled off his fancy coat and threw him into a dry well. And as Joseph's brothers sat down to eat their lunch, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with all kinds of spices that they were taking to Egypt. So Judah said, what will we gain if we kill our brother and hide his body? Let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not harm him. After all, he is our brother. So they agreed. When the Midianite merchants came by, Joseph's brothers took him out of the well, and for 20 pieces of silver they sold him to the Ishmaelites, who took him to Egypt. But when Reuben returned to the well and did not find Joseph there, he tore his clothes in sorrow. Then he went back to his brothers and said, The boy is gone. What am I going to do? Joseph's brothers then killed a goat and dipped jo Joseph's fancy coat in its blood. After this, they took the coat to their father and said, We found this. Look at it carefully and see if it belongs to your son. Right away, Jacob knew it was Joseph's coat and said, It's my son's coat. Joseph has been torn to pieces and eaten by some wild animal. Jacob mourned for Joseph a very long time. And to show his sorrow, he tore his clothes and wore sackcloth. All of his children came to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, he said, I will go to my grave mourning for my son. Meanwhile, the Midianites had sold Joseph in Egypt to a man named Potiphar, who was the king's official in charge of the palace guard. Well, I guess if you want to read the rest of that story, you, you have your Bible. It's in Genesis 37. In the year following the death of Nelson Mandela, a song was written for him. Asim Bonanga, Asim Bonanga. And it was taped and it made the rounds on the internet. The plaintive call is calling out for the soul of Nelson Mandela. Where is the soul of Nelson Mandela? Asim Bonanga. Asim Bonanga. There's a version of the song online by the Soweto Gospel Choir, which grips me every time I see it. And it grips me, I think, because even though I never knew Nelson Mandela, nor did I ever have the chance to see him in person, still there's something about his story that rings true deep within. There's an understory to it. And the understory is the story of a tortured soul seeking freedom and release from exile while embodying those very same things for his nation, a tortured nation seeking to be freed from its exile. And it's a compelling story which is shared across time and through many cultures, tracking the soul of a people learning it must choose a different path to find its footing again. When Nelson Mandela emerged from his prison in February 1990, I'm sure you remember that, uh, that moment in time, because the eyes of the world were turned on him. We knew his story, some of the suffering and pain, 
We knew the backstory of his wife, Winnie, and the struggle to carry on uh, while Nelson was in prison. We knew the strength of the South African military and their desire to keep apartheid in place because of the huge economic gains it meant for the nation. And yet, at that moment, when he emerged from prison, we knew it was all going to change. The soul of humanity was embodied in Nelson Mandela that day. And so his next steps would show us the movement of the human soul, right? Because he embodied so very much of what uh, a tortured soul means. And so rising to the occasion, which you know he did, and charting a brand new path, which you also know he did, Mandela confirmed a certain myth that has power and agency and truth. And it is the myth of the one good person or a virtuous person who can save it all, right? There's this myth of one good person who can save us all. We'll save the earth, we'll save humanity, we'll end our suffering. A good time will come where peace will prevail and those with good values and virtues will see justice and peace. And so this kind of deep abiding desire for one person to be able to rise up and and claim the goodness of humanity is buried very deep within our souls. Now, during COVID, the myth of the good person, the myth of the redemption brought about by a good person has been particularly evocative right here in our own country. Without being political, and I mean that uh, truly, without being political, let me say that I think Justin Trudeau has been a textbook case of this. In the first few weeks of the crisis, there he was, every single day, descending the steps of Rideau College uh, Cottage, walking down those steps up to the microphone, bringing us the plan, bringing us the goods, bringing us hope. It was reassuring. Doug Ford was doing the same, and, and again, not being political. That's a big thing for, for somebody like me to say. But it, it showed how very deep is the desire in our souls to believe in the good and to see someone acting out of goodness to redeem the suffering of many. We project that desire onto people. Uh, Another contemporary example would be George Clooney, believe it or not. Uh, But Trudeau is also a really good example. And in his case, another part of the myth has also become evident, which is the extreme doubt that we have that any one good person can redeem humanity. Isn't that interesting? How quickly he falls from grace, making a mistake or two. Maybe there are big mistakes, but a couple of mistakes that show a fatal flaw in character. All of a sudden brings the myth down to our level and we see, ah, perhaps it isn't true. Perhaps it's just a myth. During times of great suffering or persecution, we tell these myths to reassure and comfort comfort us because soon we hope the Savior will appear. And I haven't mentioned Jesus yet on purpose because I hope that you've been thinking about him because, of course, he is another type of this very myth. And in fact, within Christianity, there's still a prevalent belief that Jesus will come again, that he'll come back and redeem all of humanity at the very end of time, which is an apocalyptic myth. But this uh, story gained agency and currency in the days after his death because life was truly ugly then. 
people were being persecuted, hunted down, and killed if they mentioned his name. And so the thought arose, one day our Savior will come. He'll come back. Now we all know that he didn't. Jesus didn't come again as had been expected. And even though the church eventually realized that something better happened, which was that his spirit came alive in people and lives on through them, the church still nurtured this dream that one day the Christ would return. But I'm just going to step out on a ledge here this morning and say to you that in terms of a myth to live by, it's not very satisfying. And that's because it keeps us stuck. It keeps us stuck in the muck. Just a little aside, I think that this is partly why Black Lives Matter has gained so much steam during the COVID crisis. Disparate groups, yes, but they seem to have realized that there's no savior coming. There's no Martin Luther King or Nelson Mandela who is rising up to uh, bring the, the troops, as it were, together. Instead, they've organized at the grassroots level, which is a much different way to bring about uh, the resolution that they may be looking for. And during COVID, they've had the time, right? They've had the time. People have the time to support the cause and to go to the protests and to continue the movement. It's fascinating to watch without a national leader stepping up to kind of carry on this myth of the one good person. Another interesting piece of that is that we, in the kind of, let's call it the dominant culture, also have the time to study the issue of race. And we're reading books that we never would have read before. We're abandoning our, our long-practiced excuses that we don't have the time. Interesting. Well, back to Joseph. The Joseph story in the Hebrew uh, scriptures takes up an awful lot of space in the book of Genesis. It goes on for, as I said, 10 chapters. We have family drama, we have subterfuge, acts of vengeance, acts of retribution, favoritism, braggadocio, prison, release, and a surprising reversal at the end. Joseph is sold into slavery, but let's face it, he's kind of a brat. And then he rises to become the Pharaoh's chief advisor along the way, showing elements of his better character, which allowed him the ability, in the end, to forgive his errant brothers and to make amends with his family. And so there's a long line of stories like this in Genesis where one virtuous man brings it all together, and wraps it all up. If we take a long view of scripture, then we can see this understory, this shape of a myth which runs beneath the whole of the Bible, including the New Testament. God always chooses one person, and it's almost always a critically flawed person, uh, but whose story becomes the redemptive story that then redeems the ones that they are uh, representative of. I remind you of Noah, who gathered everything and all the animals into an ark. Noah was a drunk. I remind you of Moses, who led his people through the Red Sea. Moses was a murderer. I remind you of David, King David, who was a liar and an adulterer. And so we also have Joseph, the bratty kid of Rachel and Jacob. Not one of these seems at all deserving of the hero status that the Bible gives them. But maybe what the stories tell us is that even the worst of persons 
can have their hearts turned to gold and then be able to redeem their own life. Now, do you think that's true? And I wonder if in our own personal lives, we can transcend the bad parts of us long enough to redeem our own lives. Because I know that on a daily basis, I struggle with being good. Maybe you don't think that of me, but every day there's something I do that is a mistake or a problem or a fatal flaw in my character. What kind of journey would you need to go on to discover the answers in your own life? Well, it occurs to me that we're all kind of like Nelson Mandela in prison. Plenty of time to nurture dreams right now if we wanted to. But it also occurs to me that there will come a day, perhaps soon, when COVID is kind of over and we can open our doors, walk down our stairs, kind of like Trudeau at Rideau Cottage, and make an announcement right? You have all of this time during COVID. And so at the end of it, perhaps you'll be able to face the cameras with your dream, with your plan, with the tiny little piece of redemption that you're going to put in the redemption quilt. I know that's kind of scary, but I think it's also kind of cool because like Noah, we'll be able to step out onto dry land after being in that boat for 40 days and nights and a whole new world was in front of him. Or like Joseph, perhaps we'll step out on those steps and realize that If we don't forgive our brothers, then nothing will change. Of course, you can call me crazy and you might say that I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. And maybe you think your dreams are all washed up or you're too old or maybe you don't have any left, but how can that be? Because it does seem that the myth is that God uses only flawed people to achieve good things. There's a young author by the name of Yuval Harari. He's written a lot of books. He writes about the fear in our time about the rise of technology. And the fear is that with the rise of technology, and especially he talks about artificial intelligence, um, that eventually these things will overtake us and defeat human ingenuity. Just because the machines will get too smart, they'll be able to anticipate everything ahead of time and plan out a world for us. The two things that we have as human beings that make us unique in the animal kingdom are things that machines are really good at cognitive ability and manual ability. We think things and we can make things. And so Harari's thesis is that the machines are gonna the machines are gonna be able to go ahead of us in those two areas. Now it sounds kind of plausible. But here's the thing. There's one thing missing in Harari's equations and that is the ability to dream. The ability that only humans have to consciously take hold of a dream and make it reality. And if you have ever stepped into the Sistine Chapel in the Vatican in Rome and 
gawked upward at a masterpiece created by Michelangelo, you'll understand what I mean. No machine could have ever thought of the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Our dreams, then, you see, are our gifts. Perhaps the greatest gift that we can give our kids right now is that we have not given up on the future. At the very least, our dreams remind us that there is an understory underneath our lives, some kind of subterranean spirit running through the whole of human history. And uh, a fellow by the name of Phil Cousineau, in his many writings on myths, he says that, you know, most of us, we just read these stories as entertainment. And I know the Joseph story was turned into a musical and was called the Technicolor Dreamcoat or something like that. I went and saw it, and I know that you can sit there and you can watch it and be thoroughly entertained. But you miss the point of the myth. Because, as I said about Nelson Mandela, what a myth does is it tracks the movement of the soul underneath the story. And why is that important? Because what a myth does to us is it helps us align our soul with the deeper dream of humanity. It, in other words, it brings us back to our own soul. Last week, as I was getting ready for this particular service today, I listened again to the Soweto Gospel Choir singing about the search for Mandela's soul. My heart weeps every time I hear that. But after listening to it a couple of times, I realized that I had missed something in it. Uh, and you have to go online to see what it is that, that I'm talking about, because as the choir is singing, they start to point to the audience. And then the audience, in a kind of an amazing turn, start pointing back to the choir. So you have this pointing, pointing thing going on. And, and what I realized is what they were saying is that the search for Mandela's soul has been accomplished because it is now residing in the heart and soul of, of the person, right, of you. And so in his spirit, then, the song releases kind of that redemptive power and the people learn that they can continue that long walk of freedom. Just to sum up, let me say that this is exactly what Christ calls us to do. We're called to live our lives by the Christ myth, by the Christ story, and so to find our soul aligned with the deeper dream of Christ's life, which was to live in the place of peace and honesty and beauty, the kingdom, he called it. And then when we find ourselves aligned with the kingdom of Christ's love, then we can seek justice and peace in our own time because we're strengthened by the power that we find there. And we can go out into our world and we can see the goodness and the souls of other people imperfect as they might be. And once we find that again, and this is why we have to keep coming back to it every week, because we have to keep reminding ourselves, we have to keep aligning ourselves, then we have the strength to carry that gift back into the world, this COVID world, and redeem it for love. As I reflect on it, I think it's our only chance. Amen.
So we're going to finish our service with a hymn I haven't sung in a long time. It's in the Voices United hymn book. It's number 679, and the verses, uh, and it's called Let There Be Light. my friends, may your dreams bring you wonder and solace. May your dreams open your eyes to a new way to be. May your dreams inspire you to make the world a better place. And may your dreams fill your life with beauty and hope. And may your dreams lift you to strength and courage and bring you peace. Amen.